Hey guys, what's going on? Today I wanted to make a video about Next.js server actions. And I've made a video about these in the past, looking at how they work under the hood. But I think I've learned a lot about how they work since that video. So I thought I would make another video with an example on how Next.js server actions actually work and kind of improve on my last video that I made, hopefully giving an even better explanation this time. And the reason why I wanted to make another video about them is because they're just such a fundamental part of Next.js and how you actually mutate your data on the server. So to quickly refresh the idea, the general idea behind server actions is you have a browser or a server, it could be here, sorry, or a client. Here you can have your client and it needs to call a function that exists on the server. So normally what you have is a um, server and here actually Next.js kind of abstracts this from you. So that's the nice part. When you run a create next app, you basically get a client side and there's kind of a um, boundary between the two that Next.js creates and it spins up a server uh, using node for you and that's all given for free. And the idea is that you want to, within the client, for example, when a user is filling out a form, when the user submits the form, you want to actually do some logic on the server. You want to call a function that exists on the server. And remember, a server is just another computer. So the, the, the user is on the client using their own computer on a web browser accessing your app. When they call the function on the server, it's just another program running on a computer. The only difference is, is that this computer is much faster than the one that the user is using probably. This is a server, a computer server that is owned by uh, a big tech company probably and has better specs, better RAM. So there's a lot of advantages of calling functions on the server. So you can have here like a function that you want to execute on the server. Or let's just leave it because we're in the we're already kind of within the server here. So yeah, there are advantages of executing it on the server. Like I said, it's faster. Um, it reduces the bundle size. So basically, this browser when it is loading um, your application, it doesn't need to load the function because that function exists on the server. So there's less work for the for the browser, and therefore your app is faster. Some other advantages: it's more secure. You would rather have stuff, especially secure. Uh, sensitive stuff execute on the server and not on the client so that it doesn't leak into the browser in any way. So there are advantages of doing this and server actions are kind of how you interact between these two environments and at least the way you do it in Next.js and basically all full stack applications these days, full stack frameworks. But so how are we actually going to within the client call a function that exists on the server. So let's say we have a function called um, do something, All right? So we have this function that we want to execute on the server. So one approach that we could try as Next.js developers in order to make server actions possible, and I think this is most people's mental model of how server actions work kind of under the hood, but we could try creating an API endpoint for all of our server actions. So we could have, for example, uh, endpoint here that is at API do something, All right? And then for every server action we have, so for every function that we want to call from the client on the server, we create an endpoint that corresponds to that function. So whenever the client presses the button in the background under the hood, what happens is the client calls that endpoint, right? That endpoint executes the function and the endpoint returns the result in the same kind of request and response pattern that we're used to. But that would that's kind of the naive approach, I guess. It's a good mental model, but that's not how server actions actually work. And there's a couple of reasons why this isn't the best solution. And one of them is that server actions are supposed to abstract the whole endpoint thing from you. So you're not, as a developer, the nice thing is like, when you're calling a server action is you can think, I don't care how this data is happening. I don't care about routes or the parameters I pass. I just want to call a function and return the result as if these two environments, the client and the server were just one. And if you start introducing endpoints for every single server action, you're not fully kind of abstracting that away 
from the developer, you're also exposing a public endpoint. So that means that this can now be hit by Postman or any curl requests. It's basically just a public endpoint that anyone can access. So every single kind of API endpoint that corresponded to a function would need to have some kind of authentication logic that doesn't let just any random person execute a function on your server. So that's kind of the naive approach, but it builds a good mental model of kind of how this is working. It, somehow this kind of layer here has to create a way to communicate between the client and the server. That can't be magic. We need to create some kind of protocol that transfers data between the two. All right, so we know that this is not the way that Next.js server actions are implemented. So how are they implemented? It basically comes from Next.js's runtime. And the best way to explain what a runtime is, is it's just the code that other code depends on. So for example, Node.js is a runtime that lets JavaScript code run on the server. So the reason why it's called a runtime is because it's code that JavaScript depends on in order to run on the server. So that's kind of the easiest way to remember what a runtime is. And in this case, Next.js's runtime is the code that Next.js depends on. And what that code does, if we create another rectangle and we write the Next.js runtime, is it provides the client, and this you've probably never heard of because the whole idea is that you've never heard of it. That's the point of abstraction. The whole point of this Next.js runtime is that the client is provided with a way to serialize, so to encode, those two words mean the same thing, to encode the ID of this function on the server. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a second and the parameters that it might be using. So just imagine that this Next.js has code that's in this runtime that it can use to basically pass an ID. So it can serialize, it can encode this ID and param parameters that the function call might need. So then this Next.js runtime, what it does is it makes sure that that is not JavaScript anymore. It's a language that can be transferred through HTTP. So basically through the internet. And then this Next.js runtime kind of just ships that data to the function. And I'm kind of skipping a step for now. Um, but that's how you can imagine it. So there's this abstraction here that converts these things. And with those with the ID and the parameter, we know which function to call. But how do we actually know what function to call? And how is this runtime actually making this function call? And that happens from an API endpoint. But the difference is that the API endpoint is not for every single server action. It, it's just a general API endpoint. So I think I have it on my clipboard. Yeah, right here. This is the API endpoint that basically all uh, Next.js servers or Next.js applications use when um, a server action is invoked. The Next.js runtime passes the ID and the parameters to this endpoint, this next server actions endpoint. And what happens in this next server actions endpoint is using a secret key that only the server knows, it can then actually uh, hash this ID. So using a JWT token or some kind of encryption, it can actually decode this ID that corresponds to this function call. So again, somewhere on the server, we're going to have a catalog, a catalog. And this catalog is going to have IDs and matching them to functions. So this ID is a specific hash a cryptographic hash, so it's secure. So that if you call this next server action endpoint, you're basically guessing in the dark out of a ridiculous amount of opportunity, like a ridiculous number of um, IDs that correspond to function calls. Um, so when this Next.js runtime sends the ID, it sends a public ID, basically an ID that if anyone has access to, it's not a problem because the catalog maps only the hashed ID. So maybe I should write that hash ID. And you can only find the hash ID if you know the secret key. That's the kind of the whole point of encryption and um, JWT tokens, for example. So that's how that works, right? We have this endpoint that uses the secret key to decode, and then it finds the correct function based on that ID and calls that function. And now we can just use classic 
request response cycle to just return the response that's given by this function straight to the client. We've demystified what's happening in this boundary between the client and the server and how Next.js makes it seem so seamless to go between the two. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video kind of throughout. I just threw in some fundamental knowledge, I guess, from web development. So terms like uh, what a runtime is, really understanding what a server is, just understanding that it is just another computer running in a data warehouse. Uh, and of course, just the main objective of the video, which was to understand and dive a little bit deeper into server actions. So hope you guys enjoyed and let me know what you thought.